Hello and welcome to Forensic Psychology Lesson 2. In this lesson we're going to be looking at the bottom-up approach to offender profiling. We're going to have a look at how it compares to the top-down approach, consider two examples of the bottom-up approach and apply it to a real-world concept. Then we're going to finish off with some evaluation points and finally a six-mark outline. So the bottom-up approach was largely developed in Britain, and it is most closely associated with the work of David Cantor, who you can see on the screen there. Cantor's work has contributed much to the field of offender profiling in moving it to a more scientific and empirical domain, which it kind of wasn't really part of in the past. The aim of the bottom-up approach is to generate a picture of the offender through systematic analysis of evidence at the crime scene. So it's all about their likely characteristics, their routine behavior, their social background, that kind of thing. Now, unlike the top-down approach, which we covered in lesson one, and if you can't remember that, then there'll be a link appearing on the screen right about now so that you can go and check that out if you need to. The bottom-up model does not start with fixed typologies, but rather the profile in a bottom-up approach is very data-driven and it emerges as the investigator engages in more rigorous scrutiny of the details of the offence. So it's not a case of squeezing an offender into one type or another and just kind of hoping that it fits, but it's all about creating a unique profile for every individual that's based on the data from the crime. So there are two methods that we are going to be looking at that count as bottom-up methods. The first one is investigative psychology, and the second one is geographical profiling. And we're going to start with investigative psychology, which is an attempt to apply statistical procedures and psychological theory to the analysis of crime scenes. Now, the aim of investigative psychology is to establish patterns of behavior that are likely to occur across crime scenes. Now, what they effectively do is they create a database as a baseline. So they take all of the information from a load of different crime scenes and they put it into a database using statistical procedures and then details of future crimes can then be compared to the database and that, that, that might then reveal possible details about the offender based on information from other crimes. So for example their possible personal history, their family background, etc. It could also indicate whether or not a series of offences are linked or are even being committed by the same person. Now there are three core elements to investigative psychology which we're going to have a quick look at on the next slide. And those are interpersonal coherence, the importance of time and place, and finally the analysis of forensic awareness. So, interpersonal coherence refers to the way an offender behaves at the scene of the crime, including the way that they interact with the victim, because that might reflect their behaviour in a more everyday situation. So, for example, Dwyer in 2001 suggested that some rapists want to maintain maximum control and humiliate their victims, whereas other rapists are more apologetic for their actions. And that could tell the police something about how the offender actually relates to women more generally in everyday life. The significance of time and place is also a key variable because it could indicate where the offender lives and works, or at least what area they kind of feel comfortable in and kind of know their way around in. And then finally, forensic awareness gives us an indication as to whether or not the offender's been part of a police investigation in the past. The behaviour could indicate how good they are at covering their tracks, which then could suggest that he or she already is known to the police and could already potentially be in the system. Okay, so investigative psychology, amongst a lot of other things, kind of looks at those three elements as part of an investigation. Another method used in the bottom-up approach is geographical profiling. Now, this method uses information about the location of linked crime scenes to make inferences about the likely home or operational base of an offender. 
It's based on this idea of spatial consistency, which effectively suggests that serial offenders will restrict their work to geographical areas that they're familiar with. And in this case, the center of gravity is indicated by the red pin directly in the middle, and that is likely to be, or at least be near, a base of operations for that offender. Now that spatial pattern also forms the basis of what's known as circle theory, which suggests that the pattern of offending often forms a circle around the offender's home or the offender's base of operations. As a final note, the distribution of offences often results in the offender being described in one of two ways. In the bottom-up approach, offenders either become marauders, which are people who commit their offences close to their home base, they don't travel very far, or they become commuters, which is an offender who is likely to have travelled a certain distance away from their usual residence, but they'll be travelling to somewhere that they know quite well um, and still feel comfortable committing their crime. But knowing whether the offender is a marauder or a commuter can provide the investigative team an important insight into the nature of the offence. So, for example, whether the offence was planned or whether it was opportunistic. And it can also reveal other important factors about the offender, like their mental state, modes of transport, employment status, approximate age, and so on. So, just before we move on to our evaluation bits, um, there is an example of how geographical profiling was used back in the 1980s with the so-called railway rapist, John Duffy. Now, it was in fact David Cantor who used this, and actually his rise to fame came after he assisted the police in the capture of John Duffy. Now, effectively, John Duffy carried out 24 sexual attacks on women and also three murders near railway stations in North London. And the police brought David Cantor in, who then analysed geographical information from the crime scenes and combined that with details of similar attacks in the past that had been supplied by the police. Now, in doing so, Cantor was able to draw up a profile of Duffy, which was surprisingly accurate and then actually led to his eventual arrest and conviction. So, if you take a little look there, you have Cantor's profile on the left, so lives in Kilburn, marriage problems, physically small, martial artist, and need to dominate fantasies of rape and bondage, and then the true facts about Duffy, they're all fairly accurate. So marriage problems, okay, they were separated. Physically small, five foot four. He was a member of a martial arts club. Um, he had a history of attacking his wife. He liked to tie his wife up before they have sex. So there's a lot of kind of correlations there between what Cantor said and what was actually true about Duffy. Okay, so that's just an example of how geographical profiling has been used in the past, successfully used. Now, before we move on, just a quick word of advice. Um, I'm well aware that I've given you a lot of information there and that there is a lot of information about both geographical profiling and investigative psychology. Realistically, there is way more information there than you could ever pack into an outline given the time constraints that you have if you're going to write an essay on this. However, bear in mind that this topic can come up in a, in a load of different ways. You can get a six mark outline on either investigative psychology or geographical profiling or both. Okay, so you could get a combined outline or an individual outline. You can get short answer questions, you know, like three markers or something, you know, where you kind of have to cut it down really, really considerably. But you've also got application questions as well. So all of the little individual bits and pieces that I've given you, they won't necessarily all need to be squeezed into an outline because some of them will be more applicable to application questions than um, outlines or short answer questions. But you need to be prepared for everything. Okay, so in a little while after we've done the evaluation points, we'll have a quick look at what a six mark outline could look like, but obviously it's only one of many, many different ways that you could actually write it. Okay, but just so that you can see that all of the information that I've given you can actually be condensed and cut down into the bare essentials in order to make an outline. Okay, so that'll come up 
towards the end of the video when we've done our evaluation points. So let's have a look at a couple of evaluation points. I've got four for you in total, one strength for investigative psychology, a strength and a limitation for geographical profiling, and then a little bit of a discussion point that is kind of valuable for both of them. So we'll start with a little bit of research support. Okay, so I've written this one out for you fully because it's a little bit of a long one and I just want to make sure that everybody gets um, all the right information in. So you've got research support by Cantor and Heritage who conducted analysis of 66 sexual assault cases using something called the smallest space analysis, which we kind of mentioned in the top-down approach video. So if you can't remember what that is, then maybe just go back and have a look and just remind yourself. Effectively, they found that each individual displayed a characteristic pattern of behaviors, and that can establish whether or not two or more offenses were committed by the same person. So it supports the basic principle of investigative psychology that people are consistent in their behavior and they kind of do the same thing over and over again. Moving on, we have research support for geographical profiling provided by Lundrigan and Cantor in 2001. They collated information from 120 murder cases involving serial killers in the US. They used smallest space analysis and it revealed a spatial consistency in the behavior of the killers. They found that the location of each body disposal site created a center of gravity and they suggested that it was because when the offenders started from their home base, they walked off in different directions or they went off in different directions each time they had to dump a body. But in the end, all of these different directions that they went created a circular effect around the home base, which then invariably resulted in the offender's base being located at the centre of the pattern. So that supports the view that geographical information can be used to identify an offender and also identify a home base of an offender as well. And then finally, a limitation is that geographical profiling might not actually be sufficient on its own because as with investigative psychology, the success of geographical profiling is reliant on the quality of the data that can be provided by the police. Unfortunately, the recording of crime is not always very accurate. Also, it can vary between different police forces and a staggering 75% of crimes are not even reported to the police in the first place. So that calls into question the use of an approach that relies very heavily on the accuracy of geographical data that's provided by the police from crimes that have been reported. Also, even if the information is correct, there have been a lot of critics that claim that other factors are just as important when creating a profile. Things such as timing of the offence and the age and experience of the offender. And that suggests that geographical information alone might not necessarily always lead to the successful capture of an offender. And then just to finish off, a final thought on profiling. Taken overall, the success rates for offender profiling and the views of the police forces who have used the techniques suggest that what profiling actually can't reliably do is identify an offender. What profiling actually is, is a tool for narrowing down possibilities, not one that provides exact answers. The big danger lies in sticking too closely to any one profile. And that was the case in the murder of Rachel Nichol in 1992, a 21-year-old mother who was stabbed to death on Wimbledon Common. And when the police brought in a forensic psychologist called Paul Britton to help them create a profile, it actually led to the identification of the wrong man. They identified a man called Colin Stagg after a long and expensive investigation, but it later turned out that the actual murderer was somebody called Robert Knapper. And Robert Knapper had been ruled out of the investigation because he was several inches taller than the picture that was given in the profile. So, while offender profiling can be very helpful in narrowing down the possibilities, and it has been very, very helpful in the past two police forces, it must also be used with great caution 
to avoid wrongful arrests and wrongful convictions. So just before we finish off, um, like I said before, I have a six mark outline for you, but it is only a possible outline. Like I said, there are a lot of different ways in which you can do this. So this is going to be a fairly long outline because there is quite a lot to say even after I've chopped everything down and made it a little bit shorter. Um, so a quick introductory sentence just to set the scene. A um, little bit of a comparison to the top-down approach about it not using fixed typologies, but rather is data-driven. After that, we talk about investigative psychology um, and the fact that it attempts to apply statistical procedures and psychological theory to the analysis of crime scenes. We do a little bit on interpersonal coherence, the importance of time and place and forensic awareness but we don't necessarily give everything the same amount of detail because we don't have the word count to do it. I've then go on, gone on to talk about geographical profiling um, and the fact that it uses information about the location of linked crime scenes. Again I haven't gone into masses of detail, I haven't talked about marauders or commuters or anything like that um, but I've just given kind of enough detail to show the examiner that I know what I'm talking about and that I understand what it is. Of course, depending on the question that you get in the exam, you might only want to write about one of the two. And obviously, if you do that, then you can probably cut down your word count a little bit. Um, but you will then have to make sure that you get a little bit of extra detail about whichever method you're talking about. Okay. Right, so that is the end of the video. I hope it's all made sense. The bottom-up approach is slightly more complex than the top-down approach, um, so I hope it's been useful and I hope it's been clear. If you have any questions, please put them in the comment section below and I'll do my best to get back to you ASAP. Thank you very much for listening and I'll see you in the next one.